Chapter One of the Brownies, their book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Summers. The Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. Chapter One The Brownies at School. As Brownies rambled round one night, a country schoolhouse came in sight, and there they paused a while to speak about the place where through the week the scholars came with smile or wine each morning at the stroke of nine. This is, said one, the place indeed where children come to write and read. Tis here through rules and rods to suit the young idea learns to shoot. And here the idler with a grin in nearest neighbor pokes the pin or sighs to break his scribbled slate and spring at once to man's estate how off from shades of yonder grove i've viewed at eve the shouting drove as from the door they crowding broke like oxen from beneath the yoke another said the teacher's chair the rule pen and birch are there the blackboard hangs against the wall the slates at hand, the books and all. We might go in to read and write, and master sums like scholars bright. The more they talked, the stronger grew the wish to prove how much they knew. From page to page through books to pass, and spell the words that tried the class. So through their skill they soon obtained access to all the room contained. I'll play, cried one, the teacher's part. I know some lessons quite by heart, and every section of the land to me is plain as open hand. With all respect, my friend, to you, another said, that would not do. You're hardly fitted, sir, to rule. Your place should be the dunce's stool. You're not with great endowments blessed. Besides, your temper's not the best and those who train the budding mind should own a disposition kind. The rod looks better on the tree than resting by the master's knee. I'll be the teacher, if you please. I know the rivers, lakes, and seas, and, like a banker's clerk, can throw the figures nimbly in a row. I have the patience, love, and grace so requisite in such a case." Now some bent o'er a slate or book, and some at blackboard's station took. They clustered round the globe with zeal, and kept it turning like a wheel. Said one, I've often heard it said, the world is rounder than your head. And here, indeed, we find it true, with both the poles at once in view. With latitudes and each degree, all measured out on land and sea. Another said, I thought I knew the world from Maine to Timbuktu, or could without a guide have found my way from Cork to Puget Sound. But here so many things I find that never dawned upon my mind. On sundry points, I blush to say, I've been a thousand miles astray. Tis like an egg, another cried, a little longer than it's wide with islands scattered through the seas, where savages may live at ease. And buried in the polar snows, you find the hardy Eskimos, while here and there some scorching spots are set apart for Hottentots. And see the rivers, small and great, that drain a province or a state, the name and shape of every nation, their faith, extent, and population and whether governed by a king, a president, or council ring. While some, with such expressions bold, surveyed the globe as round it rolled, still others turned to ink and pen, and, spreading like a brooding hand, they scrawled a page to show the band their special style, or business hand. The teacher had enough to do to act his part to nature true. He lectured well the infant squad. He wrapped the desk and shook the rod. 
and stood the dunce upon the stool, a laughing-stock to all the school. But frequent changes pleased the crowd, so lengthy reign was not allowed, and when one master had his hour, another took the rod of power, and thus they changed to suit the case, till many filled the honoured place. So taken up was every mind, with fun and study, well combined, they noticed not the hours depart, until the sun commenced to dart a sheaf of lances, long and bright, above the distant mountain height. Then, from the schoolroom in a heap, they jumped and tumbled twenty deep, in eager haste to disappear in deepest shades of forests near. When next the children gathered there, with wondering faces fresh and fair, it took an hour of morning prime, according to the teacher's time, to get the books in place once more, and order to the room restore. So great had been the haste to hide, the windows were left open wide. And scholars knew, without a doubt, that brownies had been there about. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Brownies, Their Book, by Palmer Cox. Chapter 2. The Brownies Ride. One night a cunning brownie band was roaming through a farmer's land, and while the rogues went prying round, the farmer's mare at rest they found, and peeping through the stable door, they saw the harness that she wore. The sight was tempting to the eye, for there the cart was standing nigh. That mare, said one, deserves her feed. Believe me, she's no common breed. Her grit is good. I've seen her dash up yonder slope without the lash. Until her load, a ton of hay, went bouncing in beside the bay. In this same cart, old farmer Gill takes all his corn and wheat to mill. It must be strong, though rude and rough. It runs on wheels, and that's enough. Now brownies seldom idle stand when there's a chance for fun at hand. So plans were laid without delay. The mare was dragged from oats and hay, the harness from the peg they drew, and every one to action flew. It was a sight one should behold to see them working young and old. Two wrinkled elves like leather browned, whose beards descended near the ground, along with youngsters, did their best with all the ardor of the rest. While some prepared a rein or trace, another slid the bit in place. More buckled bands with all their might, or drew the harness close and tight. When every strap a buckle found, and every part was safe and sound, then round the cart the brownies flew, the hardest task was yet to do. It often puzzles bearded men, though o'er and o'er performed again. Some held the shafts to steer them straight, more did their best to balance weight, while others showed both strength and art in backing Mag into the cart. At length the heavy job was done, and horse and cart moved off as one. Now down the road the gentle steed was forced to trot at greatest speed. A merrier crowd than journeyed there was never seen at Dublin Fair. Some found a seat while others stood, or hung behind as best they could, while many, strung along astride, upon the mare enjoyed the ride. The night was dark. The lucky elves had all the turnpike to themselves. No surly keeper barred the way, for use of road demanding pay. Nor were they startled by the cry of robbers shouting, Stand or die! Across the bridge and up the hill, and through the woods to Warren's Mill. A lengthy ride, ten miles at least, without a rest they drove the beast. And then were loath enough to rein old Mag around, for home again. Nor was the speed, returning, slow, 
the mare was more inclined to go, because the feed of oats and hay unfinished in her manger lay. So through the yard she wheeled her load, as briskly as she took the road. No time remained to then undo the many straps which tight they drew, for in the east the reddening sky gave warning that the sun was nigh. The halter rope was quickly wound about the nearest post they found. Then off they scampered left and right, and disappeared at once from sight. When Farmer Gill that morning fair came out and viewed his jaded mare, I may not hear in verse repeat his exclamations all complete. He gnashed his teeth and glared around, and struck his fists and stamped the ground, and chased the dog across the farm, because it failed to give alarm. I'd give a stack of hay, he cried, to catch the rogue who stole the ride. But still a wry suspicion flew. Who stole the ride? He never knew. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of the Brownies, their book, by Palmer Cox. Chapter 3. The Brownies on Skates One night when the cold moon hung low, the winter wrapped the world in snow, and bridged the streams in wood and field with ice as smooth as shining shield. Some skaters swept in graceful style the glistening surface, file on file. For hours the brownies viewed the show, commenting on the groups below. Said one, that pleasure might be ours, we have the feet and motive powers. No mortal need us, brownies teach, if skates were but within our reach. Another answered, then, my friend, to hear my plan let all attend. I have a building in my mind that we within an hour can find. Three golden balls hang by the door, like oranges from Cuba's shore. Behind the dusty counter stands a native of queer far-off lands. The place is filled with various things, from baby carts to banjo strings. Here hangs a gun without a lock, some pilgrim bore to Plymouth Rock. And there a pair of goggles lie that saw the redcoats marching by while piles of club and rocker skates of every shape the buyer waits. Though second-hand, I'm sure they'll do, and serve our wants as well as new. That place will enter as we may to-morrow night, and bear away a pair the best that come to hand for every member of the band. At once the enterprise so bold received support from young and old. A place to muster near the town, and meeting hour they noted down. And then, retiring for the night, they soon were lost to sound and sight. When evening next her visit paid, to fold the earth in robes of shade, from out the woods across the mead the brownies gathered as agreed, to venture boldly and procure the skates that would their fun ensure. As mice can get to cake and cheese, without a key whene'er they please, so cunning brownies can proceed, and help themselves to what they need. For bolts and bars they little care, if but a nail is wanting there. Or, failing this, with ease descend, like Santa Claus, and gain their end. As children to the window fly at news of Jumbo passing by, so rushed the eager band away to fields of ice without delay. Though far too large at heel and toe, the skates were somehow made to go. But out behind and out before, like spurs, they stuck a span or more, alike afflicting foe and friend in bringing journeys to an end. They had their slips and sudden spreads where heels flew higher than their heads as people do, however nice, when venturing first upon the ice. But soon they learned to curve and wheel, and cut fine scrolls with scoring steel, 
to race in clusters to and fro, to jump and turn and backward go, until a rest on bed so cool was more the wonder than the rule. But from the lake they all withdrew some hours before the night was through, and hastened back with lively feet through narrow lane and silent street, until they reached the broker's door, with every skate that left the store. And, ere the first faint gleam of day, the skates were safely stowed away. Of their brief absence not a trace was left within the dusty place. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Brownies, Their Book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Four: The Brownies on Bicycles. One evening, Brownies, peeping down from bluffs that overlooked the town, saw wheelmen passing to and fro upon the boulevard below. It seems, said one, an easy trick. The wheel goes round so smooth and quick. You simply sit and work your feet and glide with grace along the street. The pleasure would be fine indeed if we could thus in line proceed. Last night, another answer made, as by the river's bank I strayed, where here and there a building stands and town and countryside join hands, before me stood a massive wall with engine rooms and chimneys tall to scale the place a way i found and creeping in looked all around there bicycles of every grade are manufactured for the trade some made for baby hands to guide and some for older folk to ride though built to keep intruders out with shutters thick and casings stout, I noticed twenty ways or more, by roof, by window, wall, and door, where we, by exercising skill, may travel in and out at will. Another spoke, in no wise slow, to catch at pleasures as they go, and said, why let another day come creeping in to drag away? Let's active measures now employ to seize at once the promised joy. On bicycles, quick, let us ride, while yet our wants may be supplied. So when the town grew hushed and still, the brownies ventured down the hill, and soon the band was drawing nigh the building with the chimneys high. When people lock their doors at night and double bolt them left and right, and think through patents new and old to leave the burglars in the cold the cunning brownies smile to see the springing bolt and turning key for well they know if fancy leads their band to venture daring deeds the miser's gold the merchant's ware to them is open as the air not long could door or windows stand fast locked before the brownie band and soon the bicycles they sought from every room and bench were brought the rogues ere long began to show as many colors as the bow for paint and varnish lately spread besmeared them all from foot to head some turned to jaybirds in a minute and some as quick might shame the linnet while more with crimson tinted breast seemed fitted for the robin's nest but whether red or green or blue, the work on hand was hurried through. They took the wheels from blacksmith fires, though wanting bolts and even tires, and rigged the parts with skill and speed to answer well their pressing need. And soon enough were made complete to give the greater part a seat, and let the rest through cunning find some way of hanging on behind and then no spurt along the road or round the yard their courage showed, but twenty times a measured mile they whirled away in single file, 
or bunched together in a crowd if width of road or skill allowed. At times, while rolling down the grade, collisions some confusion made, for every member of the band at steering wished to try his hand, though some, perhaps, were not designed for labor of that special kind. But brownies are the folk to bear misfortunes with unruffled air. So on through rough and smooth they spun until the turning point was won. Then back they wheeled with every spoke an hour before the thrush awoke. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of the Brownies, their book, by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 5 The Brownies at Lawn Tennis. One evening, as the woods grew dark, the Brownies wandered through a park, and soon a building, quaint and small, appeared to draw the gaze of all. Said one, this place contains, no doubt, the tools of workmen hereabout. Another said, You're quite astray. The workmen's tools are miles away. Within this building may be found the fixtures for the tennis ground. A meadow near, both long and wide, for half the year is set aside, and marked with many a square and court for those who love the royal sport. On afternoons assembled there, the active men and maidens fair, keep up the game until the day has faded into evening gray. In other lands than those we tread, I played the game, another said, and proved my skill and muscle stout as server and as striker out. The lock that hangs before us there bears witness to the keeper's care and tramps or burglars might go by, if such a sign should meet the eye. But we, who laugh at locks or law, designed to keep mankind in awe, may praise the keeper's cautious mind, but all the same an entrance find. Ere long the path that lay between the building and the meadow green was crowded with the bustling throng, all bearing implements along some lugging stakes or racket sets, and others buried up in nets. To set the posts and mark the ground, the proper size and shape around, with service line and line of base, and courts both left and right in place, was work that caused but slight delay, and soon the sport was under way. And then a strange and stirring scene was pictured out upon the green. Some watched the game and noted well where this or that one would excel. And shouts and calls that filled the air proved even-handed playing there. With anxious looks some kept the score and shouted, Vantage! Game all! Or to some, Love! Forty! Deuce! Two more! But when, Deuce set, the scorer cried, applause would ring on every side. At times, so hot the contest grew, established laws aside they threw, and in the game where four should stand, at least a dozen took a hand. Some tangled in the netting lay, and some from baselands strayed away. Some hit the ball when out of place, or scrambled through unlawful space. But still no game was forced to halt, because of this or greater fault. And there they sported on the lawn, until the ruddy streaks of dawn gave warning that the day was near, and brownies all must disappear. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Brownies, Their Book, by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers Chapter 6 The Brownie's Good Work One time, while brownies passed around an honest farmer's piece of ground, they paused to view the garden fair 
and fields of grain that needed care. My friends, said one who often spoke about the ways of human folk, now here's a case in point I claim, where neighbors scarce deserve the name. This farmer on his back is laid, with broken ribs and shoulder blade. Received, I hear, some weeks ago, while at the village here below. He checked a running team to save some children from an early grave. Now overripe his harvest stands, in waiting for the reaper's hands. The piece of wheat we lately passed is shelling out at every blast. Those pumpkins in that corner plot begin to show the signs of rot. The mold has fastened on their skin. The ripest ones are caving in. And soon the pig in yonder sty, with scornful grunt, would pass them by. His early rose potatoes there are much in need of light and air. The turnip withers where it lies. The beaten carrot want to rise. Oh, pull us up, they seem to cry, to every one that passes by. The frost will finish our repose. The grubs are working at our toes. Unless you come and save us soon, we'll not be worth a picayune. The corn is breaking from the stalk. The hands around the hill can walk, and with their ever-ready bill may pick the kernels at their will. His neighbors are a sordid crowd who've such a shameful waste allowed. So wrapped in self some men can be, beyond their purse they seldom see. Tis left for us to play the friend, and here a helping hand extend. But as the waking Chanticleer is crowing in the stable near, too little of the present night is left to set the matter right. Tomorrow eve at that dark hour when birds grow still in leafy bower and bats forsake the ruined pile to exercise their wings a while, in yonder shady grove we'll meet with all our active force complete, prepared to give this farmer aid with basket, barrel, hook, and spade. But ere we part one caution more, let some invade a druggist store and bring along a coated pill, we'll dose the dog to keep him still. For barking dogs, however kind, can oft disturb a brownie's mind. When next the bat of evening flew, and drowsy things of day withdrew, when beetles droned across the lea, and turkeys sought the safest tree to form aloft a social row, and criticize the fox below, then cunning brownies might be seen, advancing from the forest green. Now jumping fences as they ran, now crawling through, a safer plan. Now keeping to the roads a while, now cutting corners, country style. Some bearing hoes and baskets more, some pushing barrows on before. While others, swinging sickles bright, seemed eager for the grain in sight. But in advance of all the throng, three daring brownies moved along, whose duty was to venture close, and give the barking dog his dose. Now soon the work was under way, each chose the part he was to play, while some who handled hoes the best brought early roses from their nest. To turnip tops some laid their hands, more plied the hook or twisted bands. And soon the sheaves lay piled around, like heroes on disputed ground. Now let the eye turn where it might, a pleasing prospect was in sight. For garden ground, or larger field, alike a busy crowd revealed. Some pulling carrots from their bed, some bearing burdens on their head. Or working at a fever heat, while prying out a monster beat. Now here two heavy loads have met, and there a barrow has upset. While workers every effort strain the rolling pumpkins to regain. And long before the stars withdrew, the crop was safe, the work was through. In shocks the corn, secure and good, now like a Sioux encampment stood. The wheat was safely stowed away, in bins the early roses lay. 
while carrots, turnips, beets, and all received attention, great and small. When morning dawned, no sight or sound of friendly brownies could be found. And when at last old Towser broke the spell and from his slumber woke, he rushed around, believing still some mischief lay behind the pill. But though the field looked bare and strange, his mind could hardly grasp the change. And when the farmer learned at morn that safe from harm were wheat and corn, that all his barley, oats, and rye were in the barn, secure and dry, that carrots, beets, and turnips round were safely taken from the ground. The honest farmer thought, of course, his neighbors had turned out in force, while helpless on the bed he lay and kindly stowed his crop away. But when he thanked them for their aid and hoped they yet might be repaid, for acting such a friendly part, his words appeared to pierce each heart. For well they knew that other hands than theirs had laid his grain in bands, that other backs had bent in toil to save the products of the soil. And then they felt, as such folk will, who fail to nobly act until more earnest helpers, stepping in, do all the praise and honor win. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Brownies, Their Book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Seven The Brownies at the Gymnasium. The Brownies once, while roaming round, by chance approached a college ground. And, as they skirmished every side, a large gymnasium they espied. Their eyes grew bright as they surveyed the means for exercise displayed. The club, the weight, the hanging ring, the horizontal bar and swing. The boxing gloves that please the heart of him who loves the manly art. All brought expressions of delight as one by one they came in sight. The time was short, and words were few, that named the work for each to do. Their mystic art, as may be found, on pages now in volumes bound, was quite enough to bear them in, through walls of wood and roofs of tin. No hasp can hold, no bolt can stand, before the brownie's tiny hand. The sash will rise, the panel yield, and leave him master of the field. When safe they stood within the hall, a pleasant time was promised all. Said one, The clubs let me obtain that Indians use upon the plain, and here I'll stand to test my power and swing them round my head an hour. Though not the largest in the band, I claim to own no infant hand, and muscle in this arm you'll meet that well might grace a trained athlete. Two goats once blocked a mountain pass, contending o'er a tuft of grass. Important messages of state forbade me there to stand and wait. Without a pause, the pair I neared and seized the larger by the beard. I dragged him from his panting foe and hurled him to the plain below. For clubs, a second answered there, or heavy weights I little care. Let those by generous nature planned at heavy lifting try their hand. But give me bar or give me ring where I can turn, contort, and swing. And I'll outdo with movements fine the monkey on his tropic vine. Thus skill and strength and wind they tried by means they found on every side. Some claimed at once the high trapeze and there performed with grace and ease. They turned and tumbled left and right, as though they held existence light. At times a fingertip was all between them and a fearful fall. On strength of toes they now depend, or now on coattails of a friend. And had that cloth been less than best, that looms could furnish east or west, some members of the brownie race 
might now be missing from their place. But fear, we know, scarce ever finds a home within their active minds, and little danger they could see in what would trouble you or me. Some stood to prove their muscle strong, and swung the clubs both large and long, that men who met to practice there had often found no light affair. A rope they found as round they ran, and then a tug-of-war began. First over benches, stools, and chairs, then up and down the winding stairs. They pulled and hauled and tugged around, now giving up, now gaining ground. Some lost their footing at the go, and on their backs slid to and fro, without a chance their state to mend, until the contest found an end. Their coats from tail to collar rent, showed some through trying treatment went, and more, with usage much the same, all twisted out of shape and lame, had scarce a button to their name. The judge selected for the case ran here and there about the place, with warning cries and gestures wide, and seemed unable to decide. And there they might be tugging still, with equal strength and equal will, but while they struggled, stars withdrew, and hints of morning broader grew, till arrows from the rising sun soon made them drop the rope and run. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Brownies, Their Book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Eight The Brownies Feast. In best of spirits, blithe and free, as brownies always seem to be, a jovial band with hop and leap were passing through a forest deep. When in an open space they spied a heavy cauldron, large and wide, where woodmen, working at their trade, a rustic boiling place had made. My friends, said one, a chance like this no cunning brownie band should miss. All unobserved we may prepare and boil a pudding nicely there. Some dying embers smolder still, which we may soon revive at will and by the roots of yonder tree a brook goes babbling to the sea. At Parker's Mill, some miles below, they're grinding flour as white as snow. An easy task for us to bear, enough to serve our need from there. I noticed as I passed to-night a window with a broken light, and through the opening will pour, though bolts and bars be on the door. And I, another brownie cried, will find the plubs and currants dried. I'll have some here in half an hour to sprinkle thickly through the flour. So stir yourselves and bear in mind that some must spice and sugar find. I know, cried one, where hens have made their nest beneath the burdock shade. I saw them stealing out with care to lay their eggs in secret there. The farmer's wife, through sun and rain, has sought to find that nest in vain. They cackle by the wall of stones, the hollow stump and pile of bones, and by the ditch that lies below, where yellow weeds and nettles grow, and draw her after everywhere, until she quits them in despair. The task be mine to thither lead a band of comrades now with speed to help me bear a tender load along the rough and rugged road away away on every side at once the lively brownies glide some after plums more round the hill the shortest way to reach the mill while some on wings and some on legs go darting off to find the eggs a few remained upon the spot to build a fire beneath the pot some gathered bark from trunks of trees, while others, on their hands and knees, around the embers puffed and blew, until the sparks to blazes grew. And scarcely was the kindling burned before the absent ones returned. All loaded down they came, in groups, in couples, singly, 
and in troops. Upon their shoulders, heads and backs, they bore along the flowery sacks. With plums and currants others came, each bag and basket filled the same. While those who gave the hens a call had taken nest egg, nest and all. And more, a pressing want to meet, from someone's line had hauled a sheet, the monstrous pudding to enfold, while in the boiling pot it rolled. The rogues were flour from head to feet, before the mixture was complete. Like snowbirds in a drift of snow, they worked and elbowed in the dough, till every particle they brought was in the mass before them wrought. And soon the sheet around the pile was wrapped in most artistic style. Then every plan and scheme was tried to hoist it o'er the cauldron's side. At times it seemed about to fall, yet none forsook their post through fear, but harder worked with danger near. They pulled and hauled and orders gave, and pushed and pried with stick and stave. Until, in spite of height and heat, they had performed the trying feat. To take the pudding from the pot, they might have found as hard and hot. But water on the fire they threw, and then to work again they flew. And soon the steaming treasure sat upon a stone both broad and flat, which answered for a table grand when nothing better was at hand. Some think that brownies never eat, but live on odors soft and sweet, that through the verdant woods proceed, or steal across the dewy mead. But those who could have gained a sight of them around their pudding white, would have perceived that elves of air can relish more substantial fare. They clustered close, and delved and ate, without a knife, a spoon, or plate some picking out the plums with care and leaving all the pastry there, while some let plums and currants go but paid attention to the dough. The purpose of each brownie's mind was not to leave a crumb behind that, when the morning sun should shine through leafy tree and clinging vine, no traces of their sumptuous feast it might reveal to man or beast. And well they gauged what all could bear, when they their pudding did prepare. For when the rich repast was done, the rogues could neither fly nor run. The miller never missed his flower, for brownies wield a mystic power. Whate'er they take, they can restore, in greater plenty than before. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Brownies, Their Book, by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 9. The Brownies Tobogganing. One evening, when the snow lay white, on level plain and mountain height, the brownies mustered, one and all, in answer to a special call. All clustered in a ring they stood, within the shelter of the wood, while earnest faces brighter grew at thoughts of enterprises new. Said one, It seems that all the rage with humankind of every age is on toboggans swift to slide down steepest hill or mountainside. Our plans at once we must prepare and try ourselves that pleasure rare. We might enough toboggans find in town perhaps of every kind, if someone chanced to know where they awaiting sail are stowed away. Another spoke. Within us lies the power to make our own supplies. We'll not depend on other hands to satisfy these new demands. The merchant's wares we'll let alone and make toboggans of our own. A lumber yard some miles from here holds seasoned lumber all the year. There pine and cedar may be found, and oak and ash are piled around. Some boards are thick, and some are thin, but all will bend like sheets of tin. 
At once we'll hasten to the spot, and, though a fence surrounds the lot, we'll skirmish round and persevere, and gain an entrance, never fear. This brought a smile to every face, for brownies love to climb and race, and undertake such work as will bring into play their wondrous skill. The pointers on the dial plate could hardly mark a later date before they scampered o'er the miles that brought them to the lumber piles. And then they clambered, crept, and squeezed, and gained admittance where they pleased. For other ways than builders show to scale a wall, the brownies know. Some sought for birch and some for pine, and some for cedar, soft and fine. With free selection, well content, soon under heavy loads they bent. It chanced to be a windy night, which made their labor far from light. But, though a heavy tax was laid on strength and patience, undismayed, they worked their way by hook or crook, and reached at last a sheltered nook. Then lively work the crowd began to make toboggans true to plan. The force was large, the rogues had skill, and hands were willing, better still. So here a twist and there a bend soon brought their labors to an end. Without the aid of steam or glue, they curved them like a war canoe. No little forethought some displayed, but wisely double-enders made, that should they turn, as turn they might, they'd keep the downward course aright. They fashioned some for three or four, and some to carry eight or more. While some were made to take a crowd, and room for half the band allowed, before the middle watch of night the brownies sought the mountain height. And down the steepest grade it showed, the band in wild procession rode. Some lay at length, some found a seat, some bravely stood on bracing feet. But trouble, as you understand, oft moves with pleasure, hand in hand. And even brownies were not free from evil snag or stubborn tree, that split toboggans like a quill, and scattered riders down the hill. With pitch and toss and plunge they flew, some skimmed the drifts, some tunneled through. Then out across the frozen plain, at dizzy speed, they shot amain. Through splintered rails and flying gates of half a dozen large estates, until it seemed that ocean-wide alone could check the fearful ride. Some, growing dizzy with the speed, at times a friendly hand would need, to help them keep their proper grip through all the dangers of the trip. And thus, until the stars had waned, the sport of coasting was maintained. Then, while they sought with lively race, in deeper woods a hiding place, How strange, said one, we never tried, till now the wild toboggan ride. But since we've proved the pleasure fine that's found upon the steep incline, We'll often muster on the height, and make the most of every night, until the rains of spring descend, and bring such pleasures to an end. Another answered frank and free, And all such musters count on me, for though my back is badly strained, my elbow joint and ankles sprained, I'll be the first upon the ground as long as patch of snow is found and bravely do my part to steer toboggans on their wild career. So, every evening, foul or fair, the jovial brownies gathered there, till with the days of spring at last came drenching shower and melting blast, which sent the mountain's ice and snow to fill the rivers miles below. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Brownies, Their Book, by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 10. The Brownies Balloon. While rambling through the forest shade, a sudden halt some brownies made. For spread about on bush and ground, an old balloon at rest they found. 
that, while upon some flying trip, had given aeronauts the slip, and, falling here in foliage green, through all the summer lay unseen. The brownies gathered fast to stare upon the monster lying there. And when they learned the use and plan of valves and ropes, the rogues began to lay their schemes and name a night when all could take an airy flight. We want, said one, no tame affair, like some that rise with heated air, and hardly clear the chimney top before they lose their life and drop. The bag with gas must be supplied that will ensure a lengthy ride. When we set sail, tis not to fly above a spire and call it high. The boat or basket must be strong, designed to take the crowd along. For that which leaves a part behind would hardly suit the brownie mind. The works that serve the town of Bray with gas are scarce two miles away. Tomorrow night we'll come and bear, as best we can, this burden there. And when inflated, fit to rise, we'll take a sail around the skies. Next evening, as the scheme was planned, the brownies promptly were on hand, for when some pleasure lies in view, the absentees are always few. But twas no easy task to haul the old balloon, car, ropes, and all, across the rocks and fallen trees, and through the marshes to their knees. But brownies persevering still will keep their course through every ill, and in the main, as history shows, succeed in aught they do propose. So, though it cost them rather dear, in scratches there and tumbles here, they worked until the wondrous feat of transportation was complete. Then, while some busy fingers played around the rents that branches made, an extra coil of rope was tied in long festoons around the side, that all the party, young and old, might find a trusty seat or hold. And while they worked, they chatted free about the wonders they would see. Said one, as smoothly as a kite, we'll rise above the clouds tonight, and may the question settle soon about the surface of the moon. Now all was ready for the gas, and soon the lank and tangled mass began to flop about and rise, as though impatient for the skies. Then there was work for every hand that could be mustered in the band, to keep the growing monster low until they stood prepared to go. To this and that they made it fast. Round stones and stakes the rope was cast. But strong it grew, and stronger still, as every wrinkle seemed to fill. And when at last it bounded clear and started on its wild career, a rooted stump and garden gate it carried off as special freight. Though all the brownies went, apart, were not in proper shape to start. Arrangements hardly were complete, some wanted room, and more a seat, while some in acrobatic style must put their trust in toes a while. But brownies are not hard to please, and soon they rested at their ease. Some found support, both safe and strong, upon the gate that went along. By some the stump was utilized, and furnished seats they highly prized. Now, as they rose, they ran afoul of screaming hawk and hooting owl, and flitting bats that hooked their wings at once around the ropes and strings, as though content to there abide, and take the chances of the ride. On passing through a heavy cloud, one thus addressed the moistened crowd. Although the earth from which we rise now many miles below us lies, to sharpest eye, strain as it may, the moon looks just as far away. The earth is good enough for me, another said, with grassy lee, and shady groves of songsters full. Will someone give the valve a pull? 
and soon they all were well content to start upon a mild descent. But once the gas commenced to go, they lost the power to check the flow. The more they tried control to gain, the more it seemed to rush amain. Then some began to wring their hands, and more to volunteer commands, while some were craning out to view what part of earth their wreck would strew. A marshy plain, a rocky shore, or ocean with its sullen roar. It happened as they neared the ground, a rushing gale was sweeping round, that caught and carried them with speed across the forest and the mead. Then lively catching might be seen at cedar tops and branches green. While still the stump behind them swung, on this it caught, to that it hung. And as an anchor played a part, they little thought of at the start. At length, in spite of sweeping blast, some friendly branches held them fast. And then, descending, safe and sound, the darling brownies reached the ground. But in the treetop on the hill, the old balloon is hanging still, and saves the farmers on the plain from placing scarecrows in their grain. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Eleven: The Brownies Canoeing. As days in shades of evening sank, the Brownies reached a river bank, and there a while stood gazing down at students from a neighboring town whose light canoes charmed every eye as one by one they floated by. Said one, We'll follow as they go until they gain the point below. There stands a house but lightly made wherein the club's effects are laid. We'll take possession after dark and in these strange affairs embark. They all declared at any cost a chance like this should ne'er be lost and keeping well the men in sight, they followed closely as they might. The moon was climbing o'er the hill, the owl was hooting by the mill, when from the building on the sands the boats were shoved with willing hands. A shadow model some explored, and then well pleased they rushed aboard. The open Peterborough, too, found its supporter and a crew. The Indian birch bark seemed too frail, and lacked the adjunct of a sail, yet of a load it did not fail. For all the boats were in demand, as well those which with skill were planned, by men of keenest judgment ripe, as those of humbler homemade type. And soon away sailed all the fleet, with every brownie in his seat. The start was promising and fine. With little skill and less design, they steered along as suited best, and let the current do the rest. All nature seemed to be aware that something strange was stirring there. The owl too hooed, the raven croaked, the mink and rat with caution poked their heads above the water, aghast, while frogs a look of wonder cast, and held their breath till all had passed. As every stream will show a bend, if one explores from end to end, so every river, great and small, must have its rapids and its fall. And those who on its surface glide, or rough as well as smooth, must ride. The stream whereon had started out the brownie band in gleeful rout was wild enough to please a trout. At times it tumbled on its way, o'er shelving rocks and boulders gray. At times it formed from side to side a brood of whirlpools, deep and wide, that with each other seemed to vie as fated objects drifted nigh. Ere long each watchful brownie there of all these facts grew well aware, some losing faith, as people will, in their companion's care or skill 
would seize the paddle for a time, until a disapproving chime of voices made them rest their hand, and let still others take command. But spite of current, whirl or go, in spite of hungry tribes below, the eel, the crawfish, leech, and pout, that watched them from the starting out, and thought each moment flitting by might spill them out a year's supply, the brownies drifted onward still, and though confusion baffled skill. Canoes throughout the trying race kept right side up in every case. But sport that traveled hand in hand with horrors hardly pleased the band, as pallid cheek and popping eye on every side could testify and all agreed that wisdom lay in steering home without delay. So, landing quick, the boats they tied to roots or trees as chance supplied, and plunging in the woods profound, they soon were lost to sight and sound. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Twelve: The Brownies in the Menagerie. The Brownies heard the news with glee that in a city near the sea, a spacious building was designed for holding beasts of every kind, from polar snows, from desert sand, from mountain peak and timbered land. The beasts with claw and beasts with hoof all met beneath one slated roof. That night, like bees before the wind, with home in sight and storm behind, the band of brownies might be seen all scudding from the forest green. Less time it took the walls to scale than is required to tell the tale. The art that makes the lock seem weak, the bolt to slide, the hinge to creak, was theirs to use as heretofore, with good effect on sash and door. And soon the band stood face to face with all the wonders of the place. To brownies, as to children dear, the monkey seemed a creature queer. They watched its skill to climb and cling, by either toe or tail to swing. Perhaps they got some hints that might come well in hand some future night when climbing up a wall or tree, or chimney, as the case may be. Then off to other parts they'd range, to gather round some creature strange, to watch the movements of the bear, or at the spotted serpent's stare. Around the sleeping lion long they stood an interested throng, debating o'er its strength of limb, its heavy mane, or visage grim. The mammoth turtle from its pen was driven round and round again, and though the coach proved rather slow, they kept it hours upon the go. Said one, Before your face and eyes, I'll take that snake from where it lies, and like a Hindu of the East, be numb and charm the crawling beast. Then twist him round me on the spot, and tie him in a sailor's knot. Another then was quick to shout, We'll leave that snake performance out. I grant you all the power you claim to charm, to tie, to twist, to tame. But let me still suggest you try your art where no one else is nigh. Of all the beasts that creep or crawl from Rupert's land to China's wall, in torrid, mild, or frigid zone, the snake is best to leave alone. Against this counsel, seeming good, at least a score of others stood. Said one, My friend, suppress alarm, there's nothing here to threaten harm. Be sure the power that mortals hold is not denied the brownies bold. So, harmlessly as silken bands, the snakes were twisted in their hands. Some hauled them freely round the place, some braided others in a trace. And every knot to sailors known was quickly tied, and quickly shown. Thus round from cage to cage they went, for some to smile and some comment on nature's way of dealing out to this a tail, to that a snout 
of extra length, and then deny to something else a fair supply. But when the bear and tiger growled, and wolf and lynx in chorus howled, and starting from its broken sleep, the lion rose with sudden leap, and bounding round the rocking cage with lifted mane, roared loud with rage, and thrust its paws between the bars, until it seemed to shake the stars. A panic seized the brownies all, and out they scampered from the hall. As if they feared incautious men had built too frail a prison pen. End of chapter 12「of inner movements gain a sight. Said one, A chance will hardly find that better suits the brownie mind. Tonight, when all this great array of people take their homeward way, we'll promptly make a swift descent and take possession of the tent. And here, till morning light is shown, we'll have a circus of our own. I best, cried one, of all the band, the elephant can take in hand. I noticed how they led him round, and marked the place he may be found. On me you may depend to keep the monster harmless as a sheep. The laughing crowd that filled the place had hardly homeward turned its face, before the eager waiting band took full possession as they planned and round they scampered left and right to see what offered most delight cried one if i can only find the whip i'll have a happy mind for i'll be master of the ring and keep the horses on the spring announce the names of those who ride and snap the whip on every side another said i'll be a clown i saw the way they tumble down and how the cunning rogues contrive to always keep the fun alive. With such remarks away they went, at this or that around the tent. The wire that not an hour before the Japanese had travelled o'er from end to end with careful stride was hunted up and quickly tried. Not one alone upon it stepped, but up by twos and threes they crept, until the strand appeared to bear no less than half the brownies there. Some showed an easy, graceful pose, but some put little faith in toes, and thought that fingers, after all, are best if one begins to fall. When weary of a sport they grew, away to other tricks they flew. They rode upon the rolling ball without regard to slip or fall. Both up and down the steep incline they kept their place with balance fine until it bounded from the road and whirled away without its load they galloped round the dusty ring without a saddle strap or string and jumped through hoops both large and small and over banners poles and all in time the elephant was found and held as though in fetters bound their mystic power controlled the beast. He seemed afraid to move the least. But filled with wonder, limp and lax, he stood and trembled in his tracks. While all the band from first to last, across his back in order passed. So thus they saw the moments fly, till dawn began to paint the sky. And then, by every flap and tear, they made their way to open air and off through lanes and alleys past, to reach their hiding place at last. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Brownies, Their Book, by Palmer Cox. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 14 The Brownies at Baseball. One evening from a shaded spot, the Brownies viewed a level lot, where clubs from different cities came to play the nation's favorite game. Then spoke a member of the band. This game extends throughout the land. No city, town, or village round, but has its club and diamond ground. With bases marked and paths between, and seats for crowds to view the scene. At other games we've not been slow, our mystic art and skill to show. Let's take our turn at ball and bat, and prove ourselves expert at that. Another answered, I have planned a method to equip our band. There is a firm in yonder town whose goods have won them wide renown. Their special branch of business lies in sending forth these club supplies. The balls are wound as hard as stones. The bats are turned as smooth as bones. And masks are made to guard the nose of him who fears the batter's blows or stops the pitcher's curves and throws. To know the place such goods to find is quite enough for brownie kind. When hungry bats came forth to wheel round eaves and find their evening meal, the cunning brownies sought the store to work their way through sash and door. And soon their beaming faces told success had crowned their efforts bold. A goodly number of the throng took extra implements along, in case of mishap on the way, or loss or breakage during play. The night was clear, the road was good, and soon within the field they stood. Then games were played without a pause, according to the printed laws. There, turn about, each took his place, at first or third or second base at left or right or center field, to pitch, to catch, or bat, to wield, or else as shortstop standing by, to catch a grounder or a fly. Soon every corner of the ground its separate set of players found. A dozen games upon the green with ins and outs might there be seen. The umpires noting all with care to tell if hits were foul, or fair. The strikes and balls to plainly shout, and say if men were safe or out, and give decisions just and wise when naughty questions would arise. But many brownies thought it best to leave the sport and watch the rest, and from the seats or fences high they viewed the scene with anxious eye and never failed the contest through to render praise when praise was due while others freed from games on hand in merry groups aside would stand and pitch and catch with rarest skill to keep themselves in practice still now double plays and balls well curved and base hits often were observed while errors were but seldom seen through all the games upon that green. Before the flush of morn arose to bring their contests to a close, the balls and bats in every case were carried back and put in place, and when the brownies left the store, all was in order as before. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Fifteen The Brownies and the Bees. While brownies once were rambling through a forest where tall timber grew, the hum of bees above their head to much remark and wonder led. They gazed at branches in the air and listened at the roots with care. And soon a pine of giant size was found to hold the hidden prize. Said one, Some wild bees here have made their home within the forest shade. 
where neither fox nor prying bear can steal the treasure gathered there. Another spoke, You're quick and bright, and as a rule judge matters right. But here, my friend, you're all astray, and like a blind mole grope your way. I chance well to remember still how months ago, when up the hill, a farmer near, with bell and horn, pursued a swarm one sunny morn. The fearful din the town awoke, the clapper from his bell he broke. But still, their queen's directing cry, the bees heard o'er the clamor high, and held their bearing for this pine, as straight as runs the county line. With taxes here and failures there, the man can ill such losses bear. In view of this, our duty's clear. Tomorrow night we'll muster here, and when we give this tree a fall, in proper shape we'll hive them all, and take the queen and working throng and lazy drones where they belong. Next evening at the time they'd set, around the pine the brownies met, with tools collected as they sped from mill and shop and farmer's shed while some, to all their wants alive, with ready hands procured a hive. Ere work began, said one, I fear, but little sport awaits us here. Be sure a trying task we'll find. The bee is fuss and fire combined. Let's take him in his drowsy hour, or when palavering to the flower. For bees, however wild or tame, in all lands are about the same, and those who rue it who neglect to treat the buzzer with respect. Ere long, by steady grasp and blow, the towering tree was leveled low, and then the hive was made to rest in proper style above the nest, until the queen and all her train did full and fair possession gain. Then round the hive a sheet was tied, that some were thoughtful to provide. And off on poles, as best they could, they bore the burden from the wood. But trouble, as one may divine, occurred at points along the line. T'was bad enough on level ground, where now and then one exit found. But when the brownies lacked a road, or climbed the fences with their load, then numbers of the prisoners there came trooping out to take the air, and managed straight enough to fly to keep excitement running high. With branches broken off to suit and grass uplifted by the root, in vain some daring brownies tried to brush the buzzing plagues aside. Said one, whose features proved to all that bees had paid his face a call, I'd rather dare the raging main than meddle with such things again. The noble voice, another cried, of duty still must rule and guide. Or in the ditch the sun would see the tumbled hive for all of me. And when at last the fence they found that girt the farmer's orchard round and laid the hive upon the stand, there hardly was, in all the band, a single brownie who was free from some reminders of the bee. But thoughts of what a great surprise ere long would light the farmer's eyes soon drove away from every brain the slightest thought of toil or pain. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Sixteen The Brownies on Roller Skates. The Brownies planned at close of day to reach a town some miles away, where roller skating, so twas said, of all amusements kept ahead. Said one, When deeper shadows fall, we'll cross the river, find the hall, and learn the nature of the sport, of which we hear such good report. To reach the bridge that led to town, with eager steps they hastened down. But recent rains had caused a rise. The stream was now a fearful size, 
The bridge was nearly swept away, submerged in parts and wet with spray. But when the cunning brownies get their mind on some maneuver set, nor wind, nor flood, nor frost, nor fire can ever make the rogues retire. Some walked the dripping logs with ease, while others crept on hands and knees, with movements rather safe than fast, and inch by inch the danger passed. Now, guided by the rumbling sound that told where skaters circled round, through dimly lighted streets they flew, and close about the building drew. Without delay the active band, by spouts and other means at hand, of skill and daring furnished proof, and gained possession of the roof. Then, through the skylight, viewed the show, presented by the crowds below. Said one, While I survey that floor, I'm filled with longing more and more, and discontent with me will bide till round the rink I smoothly glide. At night I've ridden through the air, where bats abide and owls repair. I've rolled in surf of ocean wide, and coasted down the mountain side. And now to sweep around a hall on roller skates would crown it all. My plans, the leader answer made, are in my mind already laid. Within an hour the folk below will quit their sport and homeward go. Then will the time be ripe indeed for us to leave this roof with speed, and prove how well our toes and heels we may command when set on wheels. When came the closing hour at last, and people from the rink had passed, the brownies hurried down to find the roller skates they'd left behind. Then such a scene was there as few may ever have a chance to view. Some hardly circled round the place before they moved with ease and grace, and skated freely to and fro upon a single heel or toe. Some coats were torn beyond repair by catches here and clutches there, when those who felt their faith give way groped right and left without delay. While some who strove their friends to aid upon the floor themselves were laid, to spread confusion there a while, as larger and larger grew the pile. Some rose with fingers out of joint, or black and blue at every point. And few but felt some portion sore from introductions to the floor. But such mishaps were lost to sight amid the common wild delight, for little plaint do brownies make, or bump or bruise, or even break. But stars at length began to wane, and dawn came creeping through the pane, and, much against the will of all, the rogues were forced to leave the hall. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 17. The Brownies at the Seaside. Within a forest dark and wide, some distance from the ocean side, a band of brownies played around on mossy stone or grassy mound, or, climbing through the branching tree, performed their antics wild and free. When one, arising in his place, with sparkling eyes and beaming face, soon won attention from the rest, and thus the listening throng addressed. For years and years, through heat and cold, our home has been this forest old. The saplings which we used to bend, now like a schooner's mast ascend. Yet here we live, content to ride a springing bough with childish pride, content to bathe in brook or bog, along with lizard, leech, and frog. We're far behind the age, you'll find, if once you note the humankind. The modern youths no longer lave their limbs beneath the muddy wave of meadow pool or village pond, but seek the ocean far beyond. 
if pleasure in the sea is found not offered by the streams around the brownie band at once should haste these unfamiliar joys to taste no torch nor lantern's ray will need to show our path or dewy mead the ponds and pitfalls in the swale the open ditch the slivered rail the poison vine and thistle high show clear before the brownie's eye next evening as their plan they'd laid the band soon gathered in the shade all clustered like a swarm of bees they darted from the sheltered trees and straight across the country wide began their journey to the tide and when they neared the beach at last the stout the lean the slow the fast twas hard to say of all the lot who foremost reached the famous spot and now said one with active mind what proper garments can we find in bathing costume as you know the people in the ocean go another spoke for such demands the building large that yonder stands as one can see on passing by is full of garments clean and dry there every fashion loose or tight we may secure with labor light though brownies never carry keys they find an entrance where they please and never do they chuckle more than when some miser bars his door for well they know that spite of locks of rings and staples bolts and blocks were they inclined to play such prank he'd find at morn an empty bank so now the crafty brownie crew soon brought the bathing suits to view some working on the inner side the waiting throng without supplied twas busy work as may be guessed before the band was fully dressed some still had cloth enough to lend though shortened up at either end sortie ran about to find a pin while others rolled and puckered in and made the best of what they found however strange it hung around then when a boat was manned with care to watch for daring swimmers there lest some should venture overbold and fall a prey to cramp and cold a few began from piers to leap and plunge at once in water deep but more to shiver shrink and shout as step by step they ventured out while others were content to stay in shallow surf to duck and play along the lines that people laid to give the weak and timid aid it was a sight one should behold when o'er the crowd the breakers rolled one took a header through the wave one floated like a chip or stave while others there at every plunge were taking water like a sponge but while the surf they tumbled through they reckoned moments as they flew and kept in mind their homeward race before the sun should show his face for sad and painful is the fate of those who roam abroad too late and well may brownies bear in mind the hills and vales they leave behind when far from native haunts they run as oft they do in quest of fun but ere they turned to leave the strand they made a vow with lifted hand that every year when summer's glow had warmed the oceans spread below they'd journey far from grove and glen to sport in rolling surf again End of chapter 17「Eighteen of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Eighteen: The Brownies and the Spinning Wheel. One evening, with the falling dew, some brownies round a cottage drew. Said one, "I've learned the reason why we miss the biddy biddy cry." that every morning brought a score of fowls around this cottage door tis rheumatism most severe that keeps the widow prisoned here 
her sheep go bleating through the field in quest of salt no herb can yield to early roost the fowls withdraw while each bewails an empty craw and sore neglect you may discern on every side where'er you turn if aid come to the widow's need from brownie's hands it must proceed another said the wool i know went through the mill a month ago i saw them when they bore the sack tip yonder hill a wondrous pack that caught the branches overhead and round their heels the gravel spread her spinning wheel is lying there in fragments quite beyond repair a passing goat with manners bold mistook it for a rival old and knocked it round for half an hour with all his noted butting power they say it was a striking scene that twilight conflict on the green the wheel was resting on the shed, the frame around the garden spread, before the goat had gained his sight, and judged the article aright. A third remarked, I call to mind another wheel that we may find. Though somewhat worn by use and time, it seems to be in order prime. Now, night is but a babe as yet, the dew has scarce the clover wet by running fast and working hard we soon can bring it to the yard then stationed here in open air the widow's wool shall be our care this suited all and soon with zeal they started off to find the wheel their course across the country lay where great obstructions barred the way but brownies seldom go around however rough or wild the ground o'er rocky slope and marshy bed with one accord they pushed ahead across the tail race of a mill and through a churchyard on the hill they found the wheel with head and feet and band and fixtures all complete and soon beneath the trying load were struggling on the homeward road they had some trouble toil and care some hoisting here and hauling there at times the wheel upon a fence defied them all to drag it thence as though determined to remain and serve the farmer guarding grain but patient head and willing hand can wonders work in every land and cunning brownies never yield but i as victors leave the field some ran for sticks and some for prize and more for blocks on which to rise that every hand or shoulder there in such a pinch might do its share before the door they set the wheel and near at hand the winding reel that some might wind while others spun and thus the task be quickly done no time was wasted now to find what best would suit each hand or mind some through the cottage crept about to find the wool and pass it out with some to turn and some to pull and some to shout the spindle's full the wheel gave out a droning song the work in hand was pushed along their mode of action and their skill with wonder might a spinster fill for out across the yard entire they spun the yard like endless wire beyond the well with steady hall across the patch of beans and all until the walls or ditches wide a greater stretch of wool denied the widow's yarn was quickly wound in tidy balls quite large and round and ere the night began to fade the borrowed wheel at home was laid and none the worse for rack or wear except a blemish here and there a spindle bent, a broken band, twas ready for the owner's hand. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 19: The Brownies' Voyage. 
one night a restless brownie band resolved to leave their native strand and visit islands fair and green that in the distance might be seen in answer to a summons wide the brownies came from every side a novel spectacle they made all mustered in the forest shade with working implements they came of every fashion use and name said one how many times have we surveyed those islands in the sea and longed for means to thither sail and ramble over hill and vale that pleasure rare we may command without the aid of human hand and ere the faintest streak of gray has advertised the coming day a sturdy craft both tough and tall with masts and halyards shrouds and all with sails to spread and helm to guide completed from the ways shall glide so exercise your mystic power and make the most of every hour with axes hammers saws and rules dividers squares and boring tools the active brownies scattered round and every one his labor found some fell to chopping down the trees and some to hewing ribs and knees while more the ponderous keelson made and fast the shapely hull was laid then over all they clambered soon like bees around their hive in june twas hammer hammer here and there and rip and racket everywhere while some were spiking planks and beams the caulkers stuffed the yawning seams and poured the resin left and right to make her staunch and watertight some busily were bringing nails and bolts of canvas for the sails and coils of rope of every size to make the ratlines shrouds and guys it mattered little whence it came or who a loss of stock might claim supply kept even with demand convenient to the rigger's hand twas marvellous to see how fast the vessel was together cast until with all its rigs and stays it sat prepared to leave the ways it but remained to name it now and break a bottle on the bow to knock the wedges from the side and from the keel and let it slide and when it rode upon the sea the brownies thronged the deck with glee and veering round in proper style they bore away for nearest isle but those who will the ocean brave should be prepared for wind and wave for storms will rise as many know when least we look for squall or blow and soon the sky was overcast and waves were running high and fast then some were sick and some were filled with fears that all their ardor chilled but as when dangers do assail the human kind though some may quail there will be found a few to face the danger and redeem the race so some brave brownies nobly stood and manned the ship as best they could some stayed on deck to sound for bars some went aloft to watch for stars and some around the rudder hung and here and there the vessel swung while others strung on yard and mast kept shifting sails to suit the blast at times the bow was high in air and next the stern was lifted there so thus it tumbled tossed and rolled and shipped enough to fill the hold till more than once it seemed as though to feed the fish they all must go but still they bravely tacked and veered and hauled and reefed and onward steered while screaming birds around them wheeled as if to say your doom is sealed and hungry gar and hopeful shark in shoals pursued the creaking bark still wondering how it braved a gale that might have made columbus pale the rugged island near them now was looming on their starboard bow but knowing not the proper way of entering its sheltered bay they simply kept their canvas spread and steered the vessel straight ahead the birds were distanced in the race 
the gar and shark gave up the chase, and turning back forsook the keel, and lost their chances of a meal. For now the ship to ruin flew, as though it felt its work was through, and soon it stranded, pitch and toss, upon the rocks a total loss. The masts and spars went by the board, the hull was shivered like a gourd, but yet, on broken plank and rail, on splintered spars and bits of sail, that strewed for miles the rugged strand, the brownies safely reached the land. Now, brownies lack the power, tis said, of making twice what once they've made. So all their efforts were in vain to build and launch the ship again. And on that island, roaming round, that brownie band for years was found. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Twenty The Brownies Return. Once, while the Brownies lay at ease about the roots of rugged trees, and listened to the dreary moan of tides around their island lone, said one, My friends, unhappy here, we spend our days from year to year. We're cornered in, and hardly boast a run of twenty leagues at most. You all remember well, I ween, the night we reached this island green, when flocks of fowl around us wailed, and followed till their pinions failed and still our ship at every wave to sharks a creaking promise gave, then spilled us out in breakers white to gain the land as best we might. Since then, how oft we've tried in vain to reach our native haunts again, where roaming freely, unconfined, would better suit our roving mind. Tonight, while wandering by the sea, a novel scheme occurred to me, as I beheld in groups and rows the weary fowl in deep repose. They sat as motionless as though the life had left them years ago. The albatross and crane are there, the loon, the gull, and gannet rare. An easy task for us to creep around the fowl while fast asleep, and at a given signal spring aboard before they spread a wing and trust to them to bear us o'er in safety to our native shore. Another spoke, I never yet have shunned a risk that others met, but here uncommon dangers lie, suppose the fowl should seaward fly, and never landing, course about, and drop us when their wings gave out. To shallow schemes that will not bring a modest risk let cowards cling, the first replied, A brownie shows the best where danger's thickest close, but hear me out, by sea and land, their habits well I understand. When rising first they circle wide, as though the strength of wings they tried, then, steering straight across the bay, to yonder coast a visit pay. But, granting they for once should be inclined to strike for open sea, the breeze that now is rising fast will freshen to a whistling blast, and landward sweeping stronger still will drive the fowl against their will. Now at his heels with willing feet they followed to the fowl's retreat. Twas hard to scale the rugged breast of crags where birds took nightly rest. But some on hands and some on knees and more by vines or roots of trees, from shelf to shelf untiring strained, and soon the windy summit gained. With bated breath they gathered round, they crawled with care along the ground. By this one paused, or that one eyed, each chose the bird he wished to ride. When all had done the best they could, and waiting for the signal stood, it hardly took a moment's space for each to scramble to his place. 
Some seized a neck, and some a head, and some a wing, and some a shred of tail, or aught that nearest lay, to help them mount without delay. Then rose wild flaps and piercing screams, as sudden starting from their dreams, the wandering fowl in sore dismay brought wings and muscles into play. Some felt the need of longer sleep, and hardly had the strength to cheep, while others seemed to find a store of screams they'd never found before. But off like leaves or flakes of snow, before the gale the brownies go, away, away, through spray or cloud, as fancy led, or load aloud. Some birds to poor advantage showed, as with an oddly balanced load, now right or left, at random cast, they flew, the sport of every blast. While fish below had aching eyes, with gazing upward at the prize, they followed still from mile to mile, believing fortune yet would smile. While plainer to the brownies grew, the hills and vales that well they knew. I see, said one, who from his post between the wings could view the coast. The lofty peaks we used to climb to gaze upon the scene sublime. A second cried, And there's the bay from which our vessel bore away. And I, another cried, can see the shady grove, the very tree we met beneath the night we planned to build a ship and leave the land. All in confusion, now at last, the birds upon the shore were cast. Some, tumbling through thick branches, fell, and spilled the load that clung so well. Some, topsy-turvy to the ground, dispersed their riders all around. And others still could barely get to shores where land and water met. Congratulations then began, as here and there the brownies ran to learn if all had held their grip and kept aboard throughout the trip. And now, said one, that all are o'er in safety to our native shore, you see, so wasted is the night, Orion's belt is out of sight, and ere the lamp of Venus fades, we all must reach the forest shades. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Brownies, their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter Twenty One The Brownies Singing School. As mists of evening deeper grew, the brownies round a comrade drew. An interesting tale to hear about a village lying near. Last night, said he, I heard arise from many throats discordant cries. At once I followed up the sound, and soon, to my amazement, found it issued from a building small that answered for the county hall. I listened there around the door, by village time an hour or more, until I learned beyond a doubt a singing school caused all the rout. Some, like the hound, would keep ahead, and others seemed to lag instead. Some singers, struggling with the tune, out-screamed the frightened northern loon. Some mocked the pinched or wheezing cry of locusts when the wheat is nigh, while grumbling bassos shamed the strain of bullfrogs calling down the rain. The brownies labor heart and hand all mysteries to understand. And if you think those brownies bold received the news so plainly told and thought no more about the place, you're not familiar with the race. When scholars next their voices tried, the brownies came from every side, with ears to knotholes in the wall, to door jams, thresholds, blinds, and all. They listened to the jarring din proceeding from the room within. Said one at length, It seems to me the master here will earn his fee. If he from such a crowd can bring a single person trained to sing. 
Another said, We'll let them try their voices till their throats are dry. And when for home they all depart, we'll not be slow to test our art. That night the brownies cheered to find the music had been left behind. And when they stood within the hall, and books were handed round to all, they pitched their voices, weak or strong, at solemn verse and lighter song. Some sought a good old hymn to try, some grappled with a lullaby. A few a painful effort made to struggle through a serenade, while more preferred the lively air that, hinting less of love or care, possessed a chorus kind and bright, in which they all could well unite. At times some member tried to rule and took control of all the school, but soon, despairing, was content to let them follow out their bent. They sung both high and low the same, as fancy led or courage came. Some droned the tune through teeth or nose, some piped like quail or cod like crows that, hungry, wait the noonday horn to call the farmer from his corn. By turns at windows some would stay to note the signs of coming day. At length the morning, rising, spread along the coast her streaks of red, and drove the brownies from the place to undertake their homeward race. But many members of the band still kept their singing books in hand, determined not with those to part till they were perfect in the art, and oft in leafy forest shade in after times a ring they made to pitch the tune and raise the voice, to sing the verses of their choice, and scare from branches overhead the speckled thrush and robin red, and make them feel the time had come when singing birds might well be dumb. End of chapter 21「The Brownies, Their Book」by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 22 The Brownies' Friendly Turn One night, while snow was lying deep on level plain and mountains steep, a sheltered nook the Brownies found where conversation might go round. Said one, The people hereabout their wood supply have taken out. But while they stripped the timber lot, the village parson they forgot. Now that good man, the story goes, as best he can, must warm his toes. Another spoke, The way is clear to show both skill and courage here. You're not the sort, I know, to shirk, and coward-like to flee from work. You act at once whene'er you find a chance to render service kind, nor wait to see what others do in matters that appeal to you. This task in waiting must be done before another day has run. The signs of change are in the air. A storm is near, though skies are fair. As oft when smiles the broadest lie, the tears are nearest to the eye. To work, let every brownie bend, and prove to-night the parson's friend. We'll not take oxen from the stall, that through the day must pull and haul, nor horses from the manger lead, but let them take the rest they need. Since mystic power is at our call, by ourselves we'll do it all. Our willing arms shall take the place of clanking chain and leather trace and round the door the wood will strew until we hide the house from view at once the brownies sought the ground where fuel could with ease be found a place where forest fires had spread and left the timber scorched and dead and there throughout the chilly night they tugged and tore with all their might some bearing branches as their load with lengthy poles still others strode. 
or struggled till they scarce could see with logs that bent them like a v while more from under drifts of snow removed old trees and made them go like ploughs along the icy street with half their limbs and roots complete some found it hard to train their log to keep its place through jolt and jog while some mistaking ditch for road were almost buried with their load and but for friends and promptest care the morning light had found them there the wind that night was cold and keen and frosted brownies oft were seen they clapped their hands and stamped their toes they rubbed with snow each numbing nose and drew the frost from every face before it proved a painful case and thus in spite of every ill the task was carried forward still some were by nature well designed for work of this laborious kind and never felt so truly great as when half crushed beneath a weight while wondering comrades stood aghast and thought each step must be the last but some were slight and ill could bear the heavy loads that proved their share though at some sport or cunning plan they far beyond their comrades ran around the house some stayed to pile the gathered wood in proper style which ever harder work they found as higher and higher rose the mound above the window sill it grew and next the cornice hid from view and ere the dawn had forced a stop the pile o'erlooked the chimney top some hands were sore some backs were blue and legs were scraped from slipping through where ice and snow had left their mark on rounded log and smoothest bark that morning when the parson rose against the pane he pressed his nose and tried the outer world to scan to learn how signs of weather ran but round the house behind before in front of window shed and door the wood was piled to such a height but little sky was left in sight when next he climbed his pulpit stair he touched upon the strange affair and asked a blessing rich to fall upon the heads and homes of all who through the night had worked so hard to heap the fuel round the yard his hearers knew they had no claim to such a blessing if it came but whispered we don't understand it must have been the brownie band end of chapter 22「Of the Brownies, their book, by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 23. The Brownies, Fourth of July. When Independence Day was nigh, and children laid their pennies by, arranging plans how every cent should celebrate the grand event, the Brownies, in their earnest way, expressed themselves about the day said one the time is drawing near to every freeman's heart so dear when citizens throughout the land from western slope to eastern strand will celebrate with booming gun their liberties so dearly won a fitting time another cried for us who many sports have tried to introduce our mystic art and in some manner play a part a third replied with beaming face trust me to lead you to a place where fireworks of every kind are made to suit the loyal mind there roman candles are in store and bombs that like a cannon roar while round the room one may behold designs of every size and mould the wheels that turn when all ablaze and scatter sparks a thousand ways the eagle bird with pinions spread and busts of statesmen ages dead 
and him who led his tattered band against invaders of the land until he shook the country free from grasp of kings beyond the sea we may from this supply with ease secure a share whene'er we please and on these hills behind the town that to the plain go sloping down we'll take position come what may and celebrate the nation's day that eve when stars began to shine the eager band was formed in line and acting on the plans well laid a journey to the town was made the brownies never go astray however puzzling is the way with guides before and guards behind they cut through every turn and wind until a halt was made at last before a building bolted fast but those who think they'd turn around and leave because no keys are found should entertain the thought no more but study up the brownie lore they rummaged boxes piled around and helped themselves to what they found some eager to secure the wheel that would so many sparks reveal some active members of the band to bombs and crackers turned their hand while more those emblems sought to find that call the nation's birth to mind and bring from every side the shout when all their meaning blazes out ere long upon the homeward road they hastened with their novel load and when the bell in chapel tower gave notice of the midnight hour the ruddy flame the turning wheel the showering sparks and deafening peal showed brownies in the proper way gave welcome to the glorious day the lighted eagles through the night looked down like constellations bright the rockets whizzing to and fro lit up the slumbering town below while towering there with eyes of fire as when he made his foes retire above all emblems duly raised the father of his country blazed but ere the brownies large supply had gone to light the summer sky some plasters would have served the band much better than the goods on hand for there were cases all about where brownies thought the fuse was out till with a sudden fizz and flare it caught the jokers unaware at times in spite of warning cries some proved too slow at closing eyes some ears were stunned some noses got too close to something quick and hot and fingers bore for days and weeks the trace of hasty powders freaks some dodging round would get a share of splendor meant for upper air and with a black or speckled face they ran about from place to place to find new dangers blaze and burn on every side where'er they turn but few were there who felt afraid of bursting bomb or fusillade and to the prize they'd stick and hang until it vanished with a bang or darting upward seemed to fly on special business to the sky but there while darkness wrapped the hill the brownies celebrated still for pleasures such as this they found but seldom in their roaming round and with reluctant feet they fled when morning tinged the sky with red end of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of the Brownies their book by Palmer Cox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter twenty four The Brownies in the Toy Shop. As shades of evening settled down, the Brownies rambled through the town to pry at this, to pause at that, by something else to hold a chat and in their free and easy vein express themselves in language plain at length before a store their eyes were fixed with wonder and surprise on toys of wood and wax and tin 
and toys of rubber piled within. Said one, In all our wandering round, a sight like this we never found. When such a passing glimpse we gain, what marvels must the shelves contain? Another said, It must be here, old Santa Claus comes every year, to gather up his large supply when Christmas Eve is drawing nigh, that children through the land may find they still are treasured in his mind. A third remarked, Ere long he may again his yearly visit pay. Before he comes to strip the place, we'll rummage shelf and box and case, until the building we explore, from attic roof to basement floor, and prove what pleasure may be found in all the wonders stored around. Not long were they content to view through dusty panes those wonders new, and, in a manner quite their own, they made their way through wood and stone. And then surprises met the band in odd conceits from every land. Well might the brownies stand and stare at all the objects crowded there. Here things of gentle nature lay in safety midst the beasts of prey. The goose and fox, a friendly pair, reposed beside the lamb and bear. There horses stood for boys to ride. Here boats were waiting for the tide. While ships of war, with every sail unfurled, were anchored to a nail. There soldiers stood in warlike bands, and naked dolls held out their hands, as though to urge the passers-by to take them from the public eye. This way and that the brownies ran, to try the toys they soon began. The jack and box so quick and strong, with staring eyes and whiskers long, now o'er and o'er was set and sprung, until the scalp was from it flung. And then they crammed him in his case, with wig and nightcap in their place, to give some customer a start, when next the jumper flew apart. The trumpets, drums, and weapons bright soon filled them all with great delight, like troops preparing for their foes in single ranks and double rows. They learned the arts of war, as told by printed books and veterans old. With swords of tin and guns of wood, they wheeled about and marched or stood, and went through skirmish drill and all, from room to room by bugle call. Their marathon and Waterloo and Bunker Hill were fought anew, and most of those in war array at last went limping from the fray. The music box poured forth an air that charmed the dullest spirits there, till, yielding to the pleasing sound, they danced with dolls a lively round. There fish were working tail and fin in seas confined by wood and tin. The canvas shark and rubber whale seemed ill-content in dish or pail, and leaping all obstructions o'er, performed their antics on the floor. Some found at marbles greatest fun, and still they played and still they won, until they claimed as winners all the shop could furnish, large and small. More gave the singing tops no rest, but kept them spinning at their best, until some wonder, strange and new, to other points attention drew. The rocking horse that wildly rose, now on its heels, now on its nose, was forced to bear so great a load it seemed to founder on the road then tumble feebly to the floor, never to lift a rocker more. No building in the country wide with more attractions was supplied. No shop or store throughout the land could better suit the brownie band. For when some flimsy toy gave way and round the room in pieces lay, t'was hardly missed in such a store with wonders fairly running o'er. To something else about the place, 
the happy brownie turned his face, and only feared the sun would call before he'd had his sport with all. Thus, through the shop in greatest glee, they rattled round the sights to see, till stars began to dwindle down, and morning crept into the town. And then, with all the speed they knew, away to forest's shades they flew. End of chapter 24 End of the Brownies, their book, by Palmer Cox